Welcome everyone to the penultimate session um, of the uh, of Energy Horizons 2019. Uh, this is a very interesting session that we have here. Uh, this is part of what we call Solutions Factory, and as the name suggests, this is really a brainstorming session where you roll up your sleeves and you discuss real issues that are impeding the transition in uh, the renewable energy space, uh, specifically in uh, solar as well as in or renewable energy generation or in EVs. And for this session, uh, we, have, uh, we have our partner CBI working with us in enabling and driving the discussion. I'm basically going to have just hand over the mic here to uh, Neha Kumar from uh, Climate Bonds Initiative, and she's going to run this session. Uh, over to you, Neha. Uh, just one housekeeping item. Uh, after the, we try and finish this uh, around by 7, uh, 5.45, uh, in time for the parliamentarian debate to begin at 6. Yeah, that's the only directive. Over to you, Neha. Yeah. Uh, so I know uh, that it is the penultimate session of the two-day conference. Uh, the numbers are still big. So if you could move forward, we'll have even a cozier discussion in this session. Uh, what we will do is um, we will begin with what uh, the report that we put together with CEW, which is called Financing uh, Clean Energy Transition, the Role of Green Bonds in the Electric Transport uh, sector and uh, renewable energy sector. So uh, I would invite, before we release the report, all my panelists on stage. We have Ratin Roy, who is the director of National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Thank you, Ratin. Please take a seat. Uh, then we have Donal, who is the South Asia Chief for European Investment Bank. Donal here. Uh, then I'd like to invite Naveen Kandelwal, who's the Chief Investment and Strategy Officer with Hero Futures. Hi, Naveen. You can get your tea along. <laughs> That's all right. Then I'd like to call Harold from TCX, who is the Senior Advisor over there. Thank you, Harold, for making it all the way. Please be seated. And definitely Chintan Shah, who is not messed up the timings today. So a special welcome to Chintan Shah, uh, Technical Officer, Technical Director, IRADA. Please. May I now request my colleagues from CEW, Ridhima, to show the audience the report, and then we can just have a release. Yeah. You can just come up. Just do that. Oh, OK. Each, please pass it on. Thank you. There you have. Did you have to? <laughs> yes. Uh, the rationale for this report was that uh, bond financing and green bonds spe spe specifically do offer a very uh, credible complement uh, to uh, financing the uh, green sectors uh, in the Indian economy. And yet there is a lot of haze around the benefits of green bonds. Uh, the way we have picked up, the India has, pa India has participated in the last four years uh, enthusiastically, but not so much in terms of what is required. So we wanted to put it all together in a report for readers to comprehend and contribute. The report also gives and proposes certain solutions, and that is what we will debate about in the Solutions Factory this uh, afternoon. So may I uh, just ask each of our panelists to show the report, stand up. We can have a, uh, and I will invite the author also, Prashant, whosoever is in the room, Prashant, you can come in. Kanika is uh, organizing another session, so she can't come. Arjun, please, Abhinav, there. So let's release the report. Thank you. Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, there we go. Please do read. It is a big report. It also will be, you know, you will have standalone chapters and executive summary on our uh, websites as well. So please do visit the website. Please do report the report. Do read the report. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We go back to our seats.
Before we set off, I would request Arjun to tell us all about the key highlights of the report so that we get into the discussion straight away. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Neha. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be making a short presentation to try and set the context for the ensuing deliberations on how the bond market can be used to accelerate the energy transition. So um, without further ado, let's Perfect. All right. So um, the attainment of clean energy ambitions in a number of emerging economies requires considerable increases in capital flows. This is also true about the Indian context as exemplified by two prominent clean energy segments. In the case of renewables, not only do uh, average investment flows into generation have to be tripled from present levels to meet 2030 deployment targets, but additional investments are also required in complementary infrastructure such as solar parks and transmission in order to facilitate the deployment and integration of generation capacity. In the more nascent electric mobility space, investments are needed across the value chain spanning manufacturing, uh, charging infrastructure, mobility services, and after sales services in order to facilitate the achievement of uh, planned electric vehicle penetration uh, targets. Now, uh, currently, um, most of the investment flows into clean energy in India have been driven by debt capital from domestic banks and non-banking financial companies. However, certain constraints limit the ability of these existing sources to bridge the gap between existing financing flows and those desired, uh, those required to meet uh, clean energy targets. These include uh, the mismatches between the short-term nature of the sources of funds for banks and NBFCs and the long-term debt required for clean energy uh, projects. In addition, sectoral lending limits and the high level of non-performing assets on banks' balance sheets further acts as constraints on the expansion of debt capital. In the case of NBFCs, the, a bond default by a systemically important institution in 2018 is an, uh, acts as an additional constraint as it, it, it has created at least short-term challenges for NBFCs in raising debt capital. Now, in this context, green bonds offer a useful complement to existing sources of debt capital uh, to the clean energy uh, segments. Green bonds offer the benefits of both a regular fixed income security as well as additional value from the green labeling or certification. As a regular bond, green bonds help refinance existing bank and NBFC debt, thereby freeing up this capital for additional lending in the sector. In addition, bond financing also helps diversify the investor base by providing access to institutional investors such as, such as uh, pension and insurance funds. Also, fixed coupon rates, uh, fixed coupon bonds enable greater certainty over debt repayments for borrowers as compared to variable interest rate loans. Besides these uh, characteristics of a regular bond, the additional, uh, the value from the green certification is that it lowers due diligence requirements for investors. Uh, green bonds have also demonstrated superior uh, secondary market returns co compared to conventional bonds. And the uh, green bonds can potentially further diversify the investor base by providing access to dedicated green funds. Given these advantages associated with green bonds, it's worthwhile looking at a snapshot of the current state of issuances in the Indian context. Uh, the relatively mature renewable energy sector has accounted for the bulk of the issuances, with both government-backed entities, primarily financial institutions, and non-financial corporates, primarily renewable energy developers, accounting for the majority of these issuances. However, these issuances have mostly been denominated in international currencies, uh, particularly the US dollar, and have been listed in international bond markets. Now, these characteristics of green, band, green bond issuances are symptomatic of challenges in raising debt capital from the domestic bond markets, including certain green bond uh, specific issues. Uh, the corporate bond markets in most emerging economies are underdeveloped compared to their developed country counterparts. Uh, and the same applies to India. However, in the case of the Indian market, certain key financial sector reforms and regulatory developments aimed at, the, at uh, accelerating the bond market development could uh, convert the bond market into a more viable source of debt capital. Uh, these include the overhaul of the creditor protection regime with the introduction of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court in 2016. In addition, regulatory mandates for large corporates to raise a greater share of their debt uh, requirements from the bond market and the lowering of minimum credit rating requirements for investments by pension funds could further deepen the corporate bond markets. 
Further, the introduction of market instruments for liquidity management could facilitate further uh, participation by institutional investors. However, beyond the development of the general corporate bond market, certain green bond specific issues also need to be addressed. In the domestic corporate bond market, uh, currently investors do not reward the green certification associated with, associated with the green bond as compared to a conventional uh, fixed income security. There is, cons there is a need for concerted action by both government and private sector developers private, and, and the private sector to uh, basically enhance awareness pertaining to the benefits of the green bonds among both issuers and investors. Besides this specific constraints, there is also a limited supply or a limited pipeline of investable issuances in the domestic markets. Now, this is primarily because of a couple of major reasons. Um, though uh, SEBI green bond guidelines broadly define the broad categories of uh, segments that are eligible for green bond issuances, currently there is, these uh, guidelines lack a performance-based uh, lack performance-based standards for measuring the extent of greenness of projects and their respective issuances. The introduction of a granular uh, taxonomy based on performance standards can help uh, bring about greater standardization and comparability of issuances from the perspective of investors and thereby uh, potentially contribute towards greater activity in the sector. Um, besides this, a number of green bond issuances are just not able to meet uh, are not able to achieve credit ratings that are, uh, that are attractive to institutional investors. Mechanisms such as credit enhancement could be uh, one of the potential solutions to address this particular deficiency. In, additions for, in addition uh, for uh, segments such as distributed renewables and electric mobility, uh, the, the appropriate structuring of issuances through mechanisms such as aggregation and securitization could be potential uh, uh, means to uh, boost the pipeline of investable issuances. Um, with that, I'd like to hand over proceedings to Neha for a more detailed discussion of, on how green bonds can leverage, can accelerate the energy transition. So over to you. Thank you, Arjun. So after this crash course in what green bonds are, um, I hope that uh, we will be able to explicate and also talk about the related issues that Arjun talked about. Uh, but, you know, Hopefully you have understood, and if you haven't, our discussion will help uh, sorting out a few issues. So let me begin, first of all, with the broader context, and this is what we've been talking about in the conference for the last two days, that energy transition is happening. It is the pace at which it happens which is important. Uh, the shift that is taking place both in the renewable energy sector and if we include the electric mobility sector is fundamental. And I must add that it is probably irreversible as well. Now, in this case, uh, along with this, um, for some people who are not, you know, great buyers of the climate change aspect of it, but they would realize, and there is now empirical evidence which is coming in, that the process of decarbonization which is, which is happening with this fundamental shift is also coming with certain hard gains in productivity and efficiency. So in this case, we can only ill afford a halt to this process or a slowing down of this process. One of the major drivers to keep it going on is finance. Bumpy, expensive, inadequate, unaffordable, or inaccessible finance is going to be a problem for this transition to really manifest fully and in the time and at the pace that we want it to. Now, India attracts only 3% of the global investment into renewable energy. And if you look at some green bond issuances in issuance number, I would say, uh, Arjun, you said that we need about 30 billion uh, USD to 2030 to meet our international Paris targets as well as renewable energy, energy targets. And if you just compare it with the green bond issuances that have happened, perhaps we, they are the one-fifth. So mostly, predominantly in the renewable energy sector. The electric mobility sector is still fledgling. It will uh, probably, it has certain asset classes within, in the, within the sector, which could be amenable to green bond issuances. So with this uh, broader context, um, let's begin our discussion by addressing and acknowledging that financing comes on the one hand with great opportunity of investment, but on the other hand, 
all the bottlenecks that you listed, Arjun, uh, in terms of, um, you know, n uh, very limited supply or, or lower credit ratings for, for uh, Indian issuers, um, high uh, or not very cost-effective hedging options when you are uh, actually um, issuing in, uh, in local currency. Uh, all of those issues are important and they are not peculiar and particular to India alone. Other emerging economies also face the same issues. Uh, let's begin with a macro context, and uh, we are very privileged, privileged to have uh, Ratan Roy, who has been interested in this particular topic for a long time, and perhaps now has become also the proponent of why uh, we should really look at uh, scaling up this market. But Ratan, uh, do tell this audience in this room today that given the context, given the liquidity situation we have in the Indian markets, in the Indian financial markets, where most of the financial savings, domestic financial savings, are soaked up by the public sector and the government borrowing, leaving very little space for the private sector to dip into that pool. Um, uh, do you still see, with such constraints, green bonds as a real opportunity panning out in the interest of uh, the investment that is required to bridge that gap. Uh, so first, let's start with that question, then I'll come to this. Okay, thank you, Neha, and thank you for inviting me to this conference. I'm not an energy expert at all, but the macro picture you asked me to explicate in India is a fairly serious one. You were speaking of the Paris commitments. We will need by 2030 close on $2 trillion just to modernize our railways, you know, part of which hopefully will help us achieve Paris. So we are looking at a situation where uh, the need for, uh, let's say, global investments in this country is going to, you know, jump by multiples uh, as long as we continue to grow successfully. So that growth itself will bring investment needs, and what we need to do is match that need with supply. The domestic challenge is ardus. It's full of opportunity, but it's artists, and that's where I think bonds and therefore green bonds can play a role. So look, uh, on a good day, India invests 30% of its GDP, right? At the moment, FDI and FII, that's foreign saving, finance 4% of that. That leaves 26% investment, which must arithmetically, just by arithmetic, be financed by domestic saving. But when you go and count savings, on the financial side, in banks, insurance companies, etc., on a good day, you get 9.5%. So that's what we call financial savings. And the difference, 26 minus 9 or 9.5, we know exists, but we can't tap it because we don't know where it is. Essentially, it does not enter the financial system. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of money. So the domestic challenge is how to get this money into the financial system. Now, Bonds or other fixed income instruments offer, I think, the right way forward. Because what we can do with banks, we have done. We have no term lending institutions. So essentially, there is a hard retail route of going out and selling fixed income products to savers and persuading them that this is a better place to put money than uh, under the mattress or with your relative or directly into gold or housing. Why do I say that? I say that because when I was 22 years old, and that was a long time ago, uh, there was a man called Dhirubhai Ambani who didn't grow his business by going to a public sector bank. He grew his business by treading shoe leather, going out to small investors in Gujarat and Maharashtra and Rajasthan and securing their money initially for what he used to call non-convertible debentures, which are fixed income products. Then these became convertible, and you know the whole equity story of Reliance. It's one of our biggest companies today. So we have done it before. We have unlocked savings that are presently not in the financial system when we've had a good product to offer. And that's where green bonds come in. If we can actually tread this retail route, that is get the suits in Bombay, some of you are here, I hope, out into the class two and class three towns of India with a product that offers returns and security the money is there. And we need that money to come into the formal financial system like yesterday. Without that money coming in the formal financial system like yesterday, the kinds of investments we need to, meet, get to, to, to make to get growth 
will not happen in substantial measure. And to do that, a fixed income product works well. And what a green bond product does is what the report reflects. It actually assures the investor that there is, in this very faulty surveillance country, sufficient surveillance happening that the product is delivering the value that it is expected to deliver. So in addition to sort of fiduciary oversight, you have the sustainability oversight, which makes the case for this money to be lent. For me, not on the basis that it's green. I, wouldn't, I don't particularly care in this context about that. But it is productive. So public investment in public housing, which is mm. green, is productive. Investment in agriculture, which is green, zero-based budgeting, is productive. And if you can get green money there, then we have a meeting between the sustainability and the financial lead agendas, which is an opportunity just waiting to be exploited. Imagine the economy will grow by at least 10 to 11% a year. So when I say the difference is 27% of GDP, that is also growing by 11%. There are trillions of dollars out there to be, uh, to be mobilized. And innovative instruments such as these, I strongly believe, and that's why I'm here, are the way forward. If we cannot grow our bond market vanilla, heck, this offers a huge opportunity for us to grow it green. Uh, thanks, Ratin. And I have to ask you another question at this juncture. Yes, I mean, uh, coming from you and also, you know, I think felt uh, by the issuers that this is an opportunity and this is the way forward. Yet, we do feel that much more needs to be done to tap this market. Mm -hmm. And the report actually makes a proposition that governments, by which I mean the central and the state governments, can actually play a much more proactive role in both being issuers by raising money which at, at, at good terms for themselves and in the states which have uh, you know, RE uh, assets and the electric mobility plans pretty much laid out. Uh, but they can also be very, very big uh, market makers in terms of infuse, infusing liquidity into the market. What would you say about that? Would the states be in a position to go to the domestic market as well as international market to raise uh, green bonds, uh, money through green, green well, bonds? I have a calibrated answer. Okay. Right? It's a very important question. The first calibrated answer is that the governments of India are already soaking up over 80% of total financial savings. So when we want to unlock financial save, uh, physical savings and make them financial savings, my preference would be private investors. And the problem is you used the word issuers. Hmm. They sit in Bombay. This is not going to work. The money lies in the small towns of India, in the Coimbatore, in the Indores, in the Ranchis, in the Trichis. And I keep telling my friends in Bombay, you have a Marriott now in every town, please go. Don't sit in Bombay and issue prospectuses and expect people to come to you. Speak the languages of the people of India who have savings. Go and talk to them. That's what Dhirubhai Ambani did. And find out what excites them and motivates them about investment opportunities. Bombay is terrible at doing this. Bombay is very happy sitting there borrowing, you know, government debt, you know, wearing nice suits and walking between the Taj Mahal Hotel and BKC in Bombay with an occasional weekly trip to Delhi. Bombay does not go to Ranchi. Bombay does not go to Trichy. Bombay does not go to Indore. They are not interested. And that's why I'm not so interested in MBAs in finance. I think green bonds, if they're going to succeed, and this is very important because there's so many investors here, you guys need to reach out to hungry financiers in the tier two and tier three cities where you operate and get them to be market makers. Having said that, there is therefore considerable scope for government to fix regulations and incentives in a way that allows these people who are hungry to come and make money. I'm from Bombay, I'm not from Delhi, I have very little time for government. You know, in Hindi, I want dhanda chahiye mujhe. To ja ke dhanda karo na. Dhanda is in the small towns. There's lots of money to be made in the small towns. Follow Dhirubhai Ambani. Government, in addition, of course, can make the market by supporting this process and there to a limited extent. I think there is room to look at whether government borrowing by parastatals especially at the hmm. state level can play a role. The final point I want to make is that now that the government of India appears to have taken a decision which I fully hope will be reversed, it's a <laughs> terrible decision in my view, <laughs> to borrow sovereign internationally, to issue dollar-denominated debt internationally. My major argument against doing this, which is it is against the policy of the government of India, is in grave potential of being irrelevant. But watch that space. I'm not giving up yet. <laughs> uh, if that is the case that I've got to ask, which is the appropriate level of government of India that should be doing this? And then I have something to tell you as a public finance guy. The budgets and the fiscal position of our states, taken collectively, is far better than the budget and fiscal position of the government of India. So if you must go now, 
for sovereign borrowing, which I hope you will not do, then I'd rather it be the states. So there is some limited scope here, I think, to experiment with at least joint ventures between the government of India and the states to engage in sovereign borrowing, not least because the value in green bonds and the projects you're doing are closer to the ground, if I understand correctly, it's in agriculture, it's in renewables, and that's why the states are in a bit, much better position to be partners. So with that very limited and pessimistic uh -huh. calibration, yes, if you must borrow a dollar abroad and you must be government borrowing it abroad, go to the states. But the main point I want to make is there is this opportunity, there's this trillion dollar opportunity which financiers need to take. It does not require an MBA in finance. In fact, the last thing it requires is an MBA in finance. It requires hunger to make money. I'm only asking you for capitalism. If you get that, I think green bonds is a fantastic way forward. Thanks, Ratin. Uh, that was a very forceful and forthright uh, argument in the favor of green bonds and also the participation and the larger role that the states, the sub-sovereign uh, level, can actually play in making this market and also raising money for their uh, investment needs. Uh, now, as you said about the hunger for money and there is a trillion dollar opportunity, I have to ask my colleagues on the uh, stage, uh, let me begin with Naveen. Uh, Hero Futures did issue uh, a green bonds, a certified green bonds at that. Uh, but at the same time, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, problems that there are for private uh, issuers, uh, corporate sector issuers, is that their credit ratings uh, do not match up. Uh, in, the, in the international markets. Uh, the, again, you know, I will repeat it, uh, and because we have uh, Harald uh, later on to actually also tell us a little bit more about the hedging cost aspect of it, that is also expensive. So in all in all, the cost of borrowing is not coming down. So what, in your experience, has been the case, and what do you really think should be the, are those market uh, instruments which are in place which are actually working or not working, and what should be done to make them work? Naveen. Sure, sure, Nia. First of all, thanks, uh, thanks for um, having me here on the panel. And um, Ratin's views were very, very uh, sort of uh, a good starting point, uh, set a very good macro context. Uh, now giving a um, micro view, uh, straight from the corporates of India, and because uh, we are discussing about green bonds only, so I will, I will, I will, split the discussion between the bonds and the green bonds. Sure. So sure. I think the fundamental question is, leaving green part aside, Indian capital markets are absolutely shallow. They have been shallow for the last 20 years. We thought every time we think in next three years we'll reach there, and these three years uh, periods have passed maybe five, six, seven times, and we are still there, right? Shallowness is visible now. This is the peakest time of shallowness when government securities of India are going no mm -hmm. south, we are at 6.3 now from 7.3456 to uh, 6.3. So such a big spread reduction because uh, yields across the globe are falling. US is going down. We are sub two in US. Uh, so many sovereigns are uh, negative, below mm -hmm. zero. India is 6.3. So everybody is rushing into India, right? But look at the corporates. There is no money at all because risk aversion. I keep talking to these Mumbai MBAs. <laughs> Uh, who, 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 who manage this money. The problem with them is, and that's actually our own making, the, the regulation, policy, entire ecosystem unfortunately has not matured. So the problem is 18 months back, or maybe 18 to maybe uh, 36 or 48 months back, there was, a, there was a golden period of two and a half, three years when these uh, Mumbai MBAs were making finance available uh, for the infrastructure, for especially the renewable energy, all these NBFCs, all these mutual funds were more than happy lending to these sectors. But because there were, uh, I'll not say uh, weakness in the regulation, but um, whether it is ALM, whether it is credit rating enhancement issues, so on and so forth, there were many issues, but ultimately, now everybody is looking at exit. Liquidity is not a problem. Mm -hmm. It's about risk aversion. I keep hearing that liquidity is available, because liquidity is that, that's why uh, yields are falling. We are 6.3, right? But nobody wants to cut checks for corporates because nobody knows what will happen and which next DHF, I, I don't want to take names, but which next thing will explode, right? So we need to address these things with policy and regulatory interventions, with market-based mechanisms, and then money will flow, as, as Ratin right, rightly mentioned. Now coming to the specifics of renewable energy sector, 
so as you rightly mentioned we we have been experimenting all the times uh, uh, in in arranging financing for uh, renewable energy sector from capital markets uh, debt capital markets uh, we have had uh, let's say mixed kind of reaction some mm -hmm. some success some failures and um, but um, overall uh, there is a there is a uh, there is a positive movement that people everybody wants to including india and globally everybody wants to invest into infrastructure because uh, it matches with the uh, i mean th th this this minimizes the alm issue the asset liability mismatch there are hordes of investors who are looking at deploying their capital in the long term uh, sort of um, income generating assets where this renewable energy fits in perfectly well right 20 25 years visible revenue stream uh, without too much variability without too much market uh, sort of facing variability but the problem is the intermediation or the ecosystem is not working right so and that's where if you look at the dollar bond markets which is picking up now mm -hmm. uh, now india uh, sorry uh, dollar bond market has attracted so many indian issuers mm. and we know in last three months itself we have issued uh, or we are about to issue okay. more than two billion dollars right uh, and um, the cost of capital is is also very very attractive now especially mm. when u.s treasuries have fallen and to address your point of cost of hedge yes that has always been a point of discussion mm. but i don't think that's the single biggest concern in the minds of issuers okay. that can be taken care i mean that's one of the factors that is fine it's more about availability of finance cost of finance and the sources of finance and which pool of capital you are tapping mm -hmm. so there are enough and more global pools of capital and even domestic pools of capital which are more than willing to give money to green bonds or bonds or sustainable finance we just need to put right mechanisms in place and one such mechanism is uh, credit enhancement mm -hmm. thing, which we'll discuss further in detail. And even to my mind, credit enhancement can also be addressed in two ways, direct credit enhancement or aggregation of demand and then doing aggregated credit enhancement, mm -hmm. by which I mean we can put in place institutions who pull this demand in because individual credit enhancement can be time uh, taking and may be expensive, may yeah. be inefficient. So we could put in place some intermediation uh, the way we did in PPS, like SEKI, mm -hmm. right? So we can put three, four, five, six institutions who pull in this demand, do credit announcement, then issue, and then attack that capital, right? So all those things are possible. We can further, when, when yeah, we, when yeah, we can sure. discuss further, but yeah. yeah. So Naveen, uh, so this credit enhancement, I'll just, you know, uh, uh, take that issue a bit further, uh, because uh, we know that IRADA also has this instrument of credit enhancement, and, and uh, uh, so does IFCL. Uh, but generally, the process involved, the lack of sort of awareness about this instrument, and also the uh, the cost involved in actually doing this, make it inaccessible to most of the people who actually want that and should be able to tap the international bond markets. Uh, what does IRADA plan to do in the direction that Naveen was men mentioning, so that actually the push comes to the sector, and uh, w w which is very much required? So, please go ahead. We do have a, a product for credit enhancement, and people have been using it in the past. Wherever it makes a commercial sense, this product gets picked up. Having said that it's got picked up, that means it does make a commercial sense, but not for everybody. Wherever if the, <clears throat> if the promoter is good, the project is good, mm -hmm. and if it can increase by one notch or two notch up, and it, thereby attain a lower cost of finance, it happens. It's all about arbitrage. But having said that, I got a couple of more things to add. Yeah, sure, okay? sure, absolutely. Uh, Ratin, you know, Dhirubhai Ambani did a lot of people learn from him. And one of the person who learned from him is K.V. Kamath. Yes. You know, before 1990, banking was corporate banking yes. in India. Corporate ko pakro, give them finance and earn money. It was K.V. Kamath who actually learned from Dhirubhai the market lies in retail segment, not in corporate. So ICIC Bank pushed retail banking in a big way followed by HDFC. If you actually see the profitability of most of the banks, the banks that have got a major retail segment are profitable in nature. And what's the reason for that? Casa. Casa earning. The, you have money in your savings account doing nothing. They give you 5%. Bank would at least have a free float of that money, would invest at 9%. So there's a 400 basis point of names available with them. This is called as Casa earning. So more the retail segment, more the free float you got, better cost earning, 
and better returns. That's the logic about banking today. Now, obviously, uh, there is this old uh, Indian saying that you don't, can't ask a cat to guard the milk. Similarly, you can't. Most of the instruments sold today in the market are by bankers. You will get a call from your bank. Okay, we have got a nice product. Please, why don't you put your money in that? So that's how the segment is. Obviously, you can't expect a bank to market the bonds market. They will lose their entire retail segment on which they're earning. So obviously, banks would never ever market a bond. I'm yet to hear. They will market products which is beneficial to them. And, and then the worst is insurance company. Actually, they'll market a product. You'll tell you get benefit when you're dead. And we do invest. So I mean, to say it's a different perspective. What is important today is renewables. When talking about green bond market, renewables is rightly placed for the bonds market for three reasons. A, most of the renewables projects, I'm talking mostly about wind and solar, they got an SPV model, a state special purpose vehicle, which essentially is ring fenced. If a project is operational and running, it is actually IBC proof. It can never go, it can never go kaput because in IBC, an SPVs are never involved. It's a mother company which gets into uh, NCLT. Second thing is, wind and solar doesn't have much of an operational risk because there's no fuel involved. The construction is done, it operates. And third thing is, today in India is most of the investors have got a good pedigree in terms of promoter background. So these three things are something unique about renewables today. Ideal product for the bond market, ideal from the risk perspective. And this is even further because now with the tightening of regulation in the banking sector, I think it's a logical way to go ahead. If you want to raise money uh, because of restriction and, the, and, the reg and the regular tightening of regulation, bond seems to be a great thing. Only thing you need to reach out to the domestic savings market and tell these guys, go, you got money under CASA earning 5%, Shift it to a bond market, you get 8.5 or 9%. I think, and as a sizable domestic saving, huge domestic savings available in India. The only thing is, people at large don't know it. So, I mean, you say that it is the perfect case and it's a perfect fit. And yet, there is a constant, uh, you know, um, a concern, or, the or, or you can say demand from the investor side, that there are no bankable pipelines that they can find. So how does this fit, you know, you, do you think that you're actually the renewable energy developers and financial institutions who are, uh, you know, financing renewable energy products, are they really tapping it at the optimum or where, why aren't there bankable pipelines? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> so I think now we, we, we can shift gears to the, to the uh, de-risking part of the, of the business, let's say. De-risking will ensure credit enhancement and credit enhancement will ensure the flow of the money through the right channels. So when we talk about de-risking, uh, it's not, so one limited part is individual issuer, individual corporate, but the overall sector uh, exposure uh, plays much, much important role or much more important role rather, right? So when we say bankable projects, uh, Nobody expects, and I will be the last one to say that banks are, uh, bond markets are supposed to finance either under development or under construction project. No. Yeah. So we'll, we are talking about operating projects. So entire construction risk, which is of either land or evacuation or X, Y, Z thing is over. Now it's about only two or three factors. One, the resource. Yeah. As long as you get two, three independent, uh, let's say, assessment from internationally reputed people of resource availability in next 25 years, then that piece is done. The second piece is the counterparty. Counterparty, unfortunately, in this case, happens to be these comms who are in the health in which they are. Hmm. That can't change overnight. That is the single biggest bottleneck in the entire ecosystem of issuing bonds by renewables or power sector. As long as we are able to address that, then I think we can address most of the problems. Now, there are no easy solutions here. Yeah. But as I mentioned, that's where the intermediation will help. Hmm. Developers won't be able to do it. Seki intervention or NVV intervention played a good, great role. We have seen the success of that. We see a lot of DFIs and multilaterals mm. now coming to India apart from IFC and ADB who are always there. We see EIB now, we see AIB now, we see uh, FMO, DG, Proparco. So many of them are now more than willing to CDC has set up shop to debt finance in the country. Everybody is because of intervention of SEKI or NVVN. This was just to my mind one good, great beginning. We need multiple such things to happen, which ensures that de-risking happens. Mm. And the moment de-risking happens and credit ratings go up, then you get 
capital flows which are required and which will make the journey or energy transition much more faster much more smoother yeah so one of the other things that the that the report proposes is that in terms of bringing the cost of borrowing down there are other mechanisms that can be tapped into uh, especially in the in the dre sector uh, like securitization and aggregation and i do have a friend here in the audience who has been working on rooftop solar uh, dhruba don't don't look surprised um, uh, so dhruba is managing the you know the platform at climate policy initiative which has been actively working and looking at actually transactions now happening in rooftop solar so my question to you is give us a little bit of a sense that whether the dre asset classes are actually ready to access capital markets and second what do you think about this hope that the securitization and aggregation mechanism uh, always, you know, there is always there, but are we there yet or how long are we going to take here? Can somebody give him the mic? And if you can share some examples, that will be very good. Oh, thanks, Neha. Thanks for calling me in. Uh, we have recently, uh, Chandan is here, uh, Chintan is here, and uh, we have recently kind of tried and published a paper on that and sort of pathways to capital markets. Uh, I would say it's a very intermediate pathway, but just to take on your question, getting to bond markets uh, for distributed renewable energy is basically small ticket size assets and small ticket size loans. So the first step, bond markets, uh, as uh, uh, many of you have rightly put it, is about circulating finance in the economy, which means that there has to be a lending first which needs to get effectively de-risked and go to capital markets, which is exactly where what Naveen Chintan we're pointing to is saying there is a need for a credit enhancement there to reach the ratings and it could go to bond markets. As of now, I think on the DRE sector, we are far away from that. First is a question of sizable building up of DRE sector lending. And then possibly comes the question of aggregating it in platforms providing adequate both internal and external credit enhancement it could take a vehicle or a structure like an AIF, which is, which is a law in India starting from 2012, you can create a category two AIF, yeah. which can possibly help it to get to capital markets, that is one. The alternative route is uh, it will help recirculate the capital within bank exposures. If those exposures are built up and they are steady state assets, in operational state, which has been fairly de-risked at that stage, if they are, they are however small, they are distributed so it is possible to create pass-through certificates, securitize them through PTC structures and essentially securitize them because it allows securitization because there's a distribution and a diversification. There can be additional collateral or some amount of internal credit enhancement created to create securitized instruments and place them. But at this juncture, we are, we are, we are way out from that. Uh, we are far away from that at this point. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, going ahead is, is the path forward. Uh, we would ideally want to see that securitization and that creation of investment vehicles which can take the exposure to bond markets. Thanks. Thanks, Ruba. Um, let me bring the question back to uh, issuances which are, you know, benchmark issuances and also back to the question of uh, cost of hedging. Uh, and I want to bring Har uh, Harold over here. Um, you, you heard, Naveen, that it is really not an issue, but you also hear, or we hear at least on various fora, that it is actually an issue because we need to bring the cost down of borrowing and yet, you know, the cost of hedging actually doesn't really bring it competitively down to the point that should make more of these issuances happen. What's your take on that? 
Well, um, thanks for, for inviting me to join. I mean, we are a very, very specialized firm, and perhaps I should introduce first quickly who, who we are and what we are doing. So I'm, I'm working for a firm called TCX. We are Amsterdam-based, and we are specialized to provide uh, hedging, currency hedging solutions uh, all across the world. And um, so India is one of the least exotic markets we are in. It's one of the most developed markets, and, and so the question is what what am I doing here? Why am I here at all? And um, so the, the answer to that is that you have a, a very well-developed market until 10 years. Um, and then afterwards, if you have the longer term exposures, which would be needed for solar finance, wind finance, suddenly you have a very thin market or not existing. And we hope, and I'm here today, in the last I was here the whole week, I hope to, we can work together with commercial banks to expand the market. So we are sort of like a development finance institutions. We, uh, we, we work uh, as a double bottom line institutions. We are, have a strong development focus and we would always work together with commercial banks or with EIB, who is also one of our owners, KFW, FMO, many which were mentioned before, to facilitate long term financing. And one of our specialties is renewable energy. Um, now let me uh, answer, answer the question. Um, so uh, this is one of the things which, which provokes me because uh, <laughs> uh, we have discussed, the co you know, um, is hedging expensive, right? If you look at your, your macroeconomic situation, you know, you're growing fast, you have inflation pretty much under control. So I think you're, what, what is offered by the hedging market is about right. I think the problem why things don't work out as, as you wish it is, some, is somewhere else perhaps. I, I, I agree one can make it better and that's why I'm here. We can extend the maturities and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to find a few pilot transactions where we can work together to extend uh, hedging uh, markets to 30 years. We can do that right now. But the pricing is roughly there. Um, I think also there there are some things which we need to talk about. Uh, one of the issues is, uh, I've heard in 2008, 2009, there were a few scandals and, and the regulator was quite restrictive after that. And what I think has happened in the past few months, there is a rethinking going on that there is more recognition that it is very important to develop the risk markets, currency risk markets, and, and, I, and I hope that, that we will, this will result soon in an expansion of the market. Um, uh, to go perhaps back to, uh, uh, to what uh, Mr. Roy said at the beginning, you know, you have the pools of money in, um, in Mumbai, in the streets of Mumbai. We also have large pools of money outside in New York, London, Tokyo. So these are the pools of money which love to come in. They look for yield. They look for diversification, all this you can offer, but they cannot take certain risks. An exchange rate risk is something like that. So it's very important for these uh, investors that the exchange rate risk is somewhere covered. So we need to develop this long-term hedging market. Then you bring in these large pools of money, and I think then you will also have a further compression of the total costs of financing, which are so important to make a renewable work. Um, but uh, I, I think the markets, key messages, the markets here are working well until 10 years. We are working on extending it. There are some misperceptions, but I think I'm very optimistic that many of these problems will be solved in the coming uh, years. You know, I want to get struck, and you also, Naveen, you want to come in over here? Okay. okay. But I just want to make one point yes. to your audience. See, I'll be very frank with many of you entrepreneurs. We are going to be a current account deficit country in the foreseeable future. And the aim of government, which I support, is that we stay at between 1.5 and 2% of GDP current account deficit. My mapping is that Cetris Paribus, given such assumptions, that necessarily means a depreciation of the currency. Hmm. Uh, again, other things remaining constant, it's complicated, but by at least 4%, and ideally no more than 6 And what we are trying to do is make sure that is not volatile, so my plea to you and to anybody else is that, you know, when you, when you present a business plan, please account for 4 to 6% depreciation is going to happen. That is not what you hedge. You hedge above that. And if you think that way, then hedging becomes affordable. So if you can provide a product which says, I'm not going to hedge you for 4 to 6%, but anything over 6, let's talk hedging, mm. 
then the government has skin in the game, we all have skin in the game, and we can work towards that actually simplifies the hedging problem quite considerably. So bluntly, without that 4 to 6% depreciation built into your project planning, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a viable project. Yeah, Harold, please. Yeah, uh, perhaps one, one impression, this is just for as a foreigner being in your country for one week now. Um, I sense that uh, sometimes risks, and I'm very grateful that you bring this up, are underpriced. Yes. People mm. don't recognize mm. the risks. And there is a high willingness to speculate. And that causes, this, that causes a fundamental weakness to otherwise very sustainable businesses. Solar power is very sustainable aside from the off-taker problem. Uh, the, the business model itself is simple. It's very simple. The sun is always shining, which is, by the way, also when you look from the trade balance, it will be a fantastic relief that you don't have to import all this oil aside from having yeah. better air, right? I mean, it's yeah. from a macro perspective, very desirable to have a lot of solar and wind. Um, but these very sound businesses otherwise are sometimes willing to take risks which they shouldn't take risks they should leave you know we should always allocate the risks to the institution which can handle it best mm. and tcx it's just one of them there are many global banks which manage it very well but we can manage these risks because we have a global diversified book of 60 currencies we always in every month we lose in some currencies and we win in others so because of this diversification we can take risks which no private business should take so, uh, Harold, just one more question over here. You've been working in various uh, economies now. What is that something very distinct about India that gives you hope uh, very, very con in a very concrete manner uh, when you look at this particular question and when you look at the growth of bond markets for uh, you know, low-carbon uh, investments? Uh, well, I'm, I'm always impressed by the competence of the people I'm meeting here. So that's... I think this is one, you have the right people here, you, you know what risk markets are in principle, you know the instruments. So this is a very developed financial system. I, I, I mean, uh, events like today, you know, where you talk about, that you talk at all about hedging. You know, that's already, there are many, many, cur many countries where we are active, where uh, the concept of hedging, you know, needs a lot of explanation. Here you have, a, you know, this is, has been a topic for many years already, so I think that's what I'm impressed here. Um, so thank you for that. Um, what I will also do is that we haven't really talked about uh, the electric mobility sector. Uh, it is a fledgling one. It is right at the start of uh, things, but there are many states which have plans uh, for investment in the electric mobility uh, manufacturing and also even acquiring uh, electric vehicles. Uh, so. Uh, Poonam, would you, would you like to say something? She's uh, our colleague at NRDC. Uh, she leads the India practice. And they have been working on this particular, in this particular field uh, and trying to mobilize finance, if I understand it correctly. Sure, thanks uh, Neha. I'll uh, try and connect it to your uh, topic of bonds and um, how bonds can play uh, a role, green bonds can play a role in this market. So sure, I accept that first we need to build portfolios of say electric vehicles um, in order to then issue bonds or, and I will even touch the topic of DRE appliances, which is again an untapped market and that needs financing. But I do think that um, I'm optimistic that the bonds market uh, could be a good avenue to even finance um, by aggregating these portfolios. We may be four to six years um, in future that this can happen, but I think this would um, uh, be a good way to finance these portfolios. Um, of course, there'll be challenges of um, where costs would increase because of, you know, you have, um, say, multiple cash flows and even um, uh, issuers. Um, there'd be complex rating and um, uh, there'd be other challenges like credit enhancements that would be required. But there are positives which would help on the cost front. For one, we're talking about risk. And uh, multiple small loans typically would um, have the advantage of high risk um, diversification. 
Um, another one I can think of is on the tenor. These bonds could be shorter tenor bonds, five to seven years, unlike the large projects which are 15 to 20 years. So that also helps on the cost front. Um, on uh, portfolios such as DREs, uh, I'm optimistic that um, carbon credits could also lead to some um, advantages on the cost front. Um, on the investor pool, again, I feel that, yeah, uh, the bonds compared to bonds of uh, large projects, it could attract even a bigger set of investors. Uh, for example, uh, the DRE segment, since it um, uh, services the rural as well as the, um, you know, bottom of the pyramid sector, it could attract even a set of uh, social impact investors other than just the environmentally focused investors. So I feel this is, um, I'm optimistic and I think there is scope for uh, portfolios of smaller loans getting aggregated in the future and green bonds being, playing a role there. Thanks, thanks for this optimism. Uh, actually, uh, when I was just before the uh, session began, I was talking to uh, Donald. And, uh, and, you know, the last uh, two days of discussion has said that we actually also need a step change in terms of the kind of investment, is the, the need of the investment and the, uh, and the scale at which the funds have to be mobilized. Um, and there is a sense that I get that there is sort of an incrementalism in all of these uh, uh, instruments that, you know, that are there. Uh, it is also realistic to say that, you know, of course they will wait and watch, they are working on market innovations and things like that. But in terms of the strategy that India should actually uh, look at when you're talking about mobilizing capital at scale, then what is, I mean, is it, a, is it a versus kind of a situation or is it something that we have to look at DRE and we have to look at expanding and broadening the tent of green bonds to that asset class which is still going to have smaller deals or we look at big capital coming to benchmark issuers and really making a, 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 a difference in terms of large liquid markets uh, which can actually then bring the cost of capital down uh, eventually for, for green bond issuances. So here, I would like to actually pull you in, Donald. Uh, you are the first green bond issuer, perhaps the largest green bond issuer in the world. You also have uh, some support programs running specifically in India, uh, which are low-cost financing instruments. I, I, I just read that you have, uh, you know, entered into... Uh, an agreement with SBI as well as Yes Bank to specifically, and Areda, okay, fine, okay, that I didn't know, um, to specifically power the investments in the renew renewable sector. Uh, what is the sense that you get over here in this discussion from your experience in other countries and from exactly your being a green bond issuer? What is that switch that India needs? to go from 8.1 billion USD right now, majority of them certified, majority of them offshore, to actually go to bridging the $30 billion, you know, re renewable sector uh, requirement, plus e-mobility sector, which is coming up. What's your take on that? Uh, thanks, Neha, for the $30 billion question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For us, uh, you know, we're obviously a, a fairly major issuer in, in uh, green bonds, but for us, the, the key term is not so much green, mm -hmm. but the bond. And the key difference between a bond and a loan is really the fact that a bond is a tradable instrument. And the tradable instrument is, is what it makes it attractive to uh, the small investors out in the countryside, that when they need access to their savings, they sell it on the open market. So the bond, the whole point about bonds is, is developing the market. And, and I think uh, Naveen said, the market is very shallow here in India. And then to that extent, it's not really a market. So we have to look at ways of developing the market. And I think the other point that came out of the, of the discussion here was the access to pools of capital. And there are large pools of capital out there. Um, I, I think there's obviously domestic pools of capital and the difficulties that we're seeing in the uh, financial markets at the moment will mean that the mutual funds are looking around 
for alternative sources of investment. Um, savings, uh, people are not getting great returns on savings, so perhaps a bond market uh, is more suited to uh, things. But internationally, there are a huge number of uh, pension funds and mutual funds out there with specific mandates to invest in green projects. And if you look at the, the investments in, in green bonds over the past uh, 10 years, they've grown dramatically, I think on, on a, globally on a compound rate of around 30%. Yes. And it's even bigger when you look at the sustainable bond market. So one of the points that comes out very strongly in your report today is the importance of green bond certification. And there's that whole four principles of, of the certification process. Exactly those same principles are now being applied to the sustainable bond, uh, bonds market, which is an even bigger pool of capital. So the whole point about this is really that uh, the going into the bonds market, the green bonds market, is about attracting um, domestic and international pools. So when people are going into the markets, what are they looking for? Well, they're going to be looking at India as a whole. And I think government's uh, recent announcement of its international bond issuance for the first time, its 10 billion <coughs> program, is probably an encouragement. And there are people out there who are interested in the combination of green and rupee exposure. They want the kind of rupee returns that they can get, well, they won't get on dollars or sterling or on, on euros. Euro returns are very small at the moment, very low. So people are hungry for for rupee returns, rupee levels. So they're looking at India as a whole. They'll look at the India's renewable energy markets. And there are a couple of issues. You know, the discoms, the, the durability of the PPAs, and, and uh, even some technical issues. We're getting to the point in the renewable energy market where uh, grid-connected storage becomes important to be able to keep the stability of the grid important. Those kind of investments are difficult financially. So there are some technical issues, and these international investors will be looking at the renewable energy market as a whole. But I think the most important issue for, for investors, both domestic and international, is about the liquidity of the market and the transparency. And the, the Green Bond uh, Initiative delivers the transparency. It's a commitment to dedicate the resources uh, to specific green projects, but also to report on it and not only report on the use of the proceeds, but to report on the outcomes. So I think that kind of annualized reporting program is a key element of the transparency and is a driver for the bond market as a whole. But in order to address the liquidity argument, I think the most important thing that we can do in India is not have lots of small, low quality uh, issuers. We need to be driving uh, a market where we can uh, drive out and focus on a few high quality uh, high, uh, issuers of high quality bonds. So we're looking at a model where we can aggregate uh, the demand, the uh, investor demand. And we have to look at ways where we can do, uh, drive out there things. And the, these small number, I'm thinking four, five, six large scale issuers of green bonds will aggregate the remaining demand, at least initially. And they will develop a yield curve so they will be issuing not just at uh, 10 years or the long term, but the whole yield curve, short term to long term. And they will be de delivering at a benchmark scale. That benchmark volume of issuance is what's going to really drive liquidity. So those are the two key factors, I think. The yield curve and the benchmark scale, in addition to the transparency. Now, there are lots and lots of good reasons for doing that. If we we look at a few of the major um, potential investors. Um, but I think that the most important ones are about the diversification of, of assets. So that I, as an investor, whether I'm a low, uh, a small scale Punjabi farmer, or I'm an international green bond investor, that diversification is important. The fact that I'm not taking exposure to simply solar or simply wind or simply storage or EV, it's an exposure to a, a diversified set of risks. So I think that's important. And then the, the green bond and the sustainable bond uh, principles deliver the credibility so that, to the market. So I think those are the key focuses going forward. It should be about scale and credibility. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Donald. Uh, I would like to bring in Prashant Yu at this moment. Uh, he is the director of policy at Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, we've been working in different emerging economies, developed economies as well. You see over here that there is a need not only to mobilize domestic investment for green, uh, in, uh, you know, to finance green investment, but also here, uh, sort of, would you consider it even bracketing as a dilemma that, you know, which way to go, where to put all your energies in, like Donald mentioned, go for a high quality issuance, big deals, let the, uh, let the world know that the big scale capital is shifting towards low carbon uh, projects, and that will actually make uh, the markets liquid as well and invite more investment and also probably uh, make the market even for the, the smaller deals to happen and uh, uh, for them to learn from the market experiences. What is your take on it? Yeah, thanks a lot, sir, for that, Neha. And um, I'll reflect on those questions and, and also some of the answers I've heard because um, it's been a fascinating exercise just listening to this and uh, Arjun did an absolutely superb job of actually summarizing some of the findings. So I won't re-rehearse some of those. But I mean, it is kind of unusual in, in, in the emerging markets that we kind of look at uh, climate bonds because in many ways it's one of the biggest uh, emerging markets and it's really, you know, we, we look at many economies across the world. Um, China is obviously somewhat larger uh, in, the, in the bond market in this space, but India is right up there. And uh, many of the other countries we're looking at uh, we're active in Brazil, we're uh, active elsewhere in Latin and Africa. India's already well ahead of. So uh, in, in many ways, um, many of the countries that we work with are actually having to learn from India. But um, I think just to sort of reflect on some of the kind of dilemma, trilemma kind of issues that we're, we're confronted with here. I mean, firstly, you know, point number one is uh, the scale of um, investment that's required in India. I think we write in our reports, it needs to rise from 10 billion to 30 billion. Now just get that number in your head for a moment. I mean, this is such an enormously large figure that there aren't really many developing countries that have to contend with those kind of figures. Now, so, let me just... so in terms of uh, the various bottlenecks, I mean, the, the first one is, is, is the immediate uh, sources of finance. And at the moment in India, it's largely the, the banks that are providing the immediate uh, uh, project finance. And I think one of the kind of interesting examples from our report on this is something that uh, CLP did, where it kind of bundled together um, already seasoned existing projects and, um, uh, and bundled them in with um, uh, projects that are still on, in development and, as a, as, and used that as a way of raising bond finance. So some of the kind of constraints from um, bank availability from non-performing assets, and as we heard yesterday, uh, PSL targets are already sort of setting kind of the, the broad parameters by which banks are allowed to lend to, and energy's already taken its chunk of better lending. So that kind of constraint is, this is a source of optimism from that. Um, but as I think we're he hearing from many people, especially um, uh, our colleagues from EIB, um, this kind of preponderance of lots of small issues. I think there's something like um, 30 different uh, tranches or issuers of green bonds in India and the total value of all of them together in aggregate is about 7.6 billion. So these are lots of smallish issues and some, some bigger ones. And you're right, we need a yield curve. It's not good enough just having lots and lots of five-year tenor ones. So um, there's, I think, um, sort of responsibility on this deepening of the, uh, the corporate bond markets. And um, one other kind of, and this second issue of the dilemma is where do we get the finance from? Now with governments um, setting kind of um, uh, security rates at 7.5% at the moment, that's a pretty high hurdle for any project to beat you know, for, uh, at no risk. So um, that's, that is a source of uh, worry. And um, when uh, sort of developers are then looking at what the options, well, one option is international finance. And as Harold and uh, Ruthen indicated, um, this issue of uh, hedging costs of being 3 to 6% or something like that above, um, that puts quite a, a premium on the cost of capital. I was really excited, uh, Harold, when you mentioned that um, uh, you, you, you're, you're finding uh, counterparties that might have an appetite for 30-year um, long-term currency hedges. And I'd be curious to hear from you whether they're being priced at the same kind of levels that um, Rutten was indicating, because that's, that's a genuinely interesting development. Um, and, and I think the other uh, thing to, 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 to bear in mind is that uh, the, the, the debt capital markets in India are relatively underdeveloped. I think uh, in our report, we, 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 we review each of the you know, various options. So the, the mutual funds, uh, my recollection, are at some, something like $100 billion uh, a year from the mutual funds, which you know, at the scale of investment we're looking for, you know, it's not going to really be enough. Um, 
the, the pension industry in India is relatively underdeveloped, it's even less than that, sort of around the same mark. And the insurance industry is about double that. So, so we do need to go overseas, or we need to somehow access the kind of um, the small tier one, tier two, uh, the smaller cities and, and unlock those finances. I think some of the ideas we've heard about of mutual funds uh, at the retail level, it's exciting, but it's un unproven territory to, to quite a large extent. So some bits of optimism there, but some pessimism. I'm really curious about the long-term hedging costs where that, if we're trying to get to the trillions of investment which we need, um, that's kind of where we are. So I think the domestic market as it is now might, might not be enough. Uh, thanks, Prashant. I know that the time's, uh, time is absolutely up and we have run out of time. Uh, if there is any pressing question, yes, there is one, definitely. Uh, yes, uh, there will be somebody to give you the mic. So I come from, uh, my name is Shubhra Mohanka, I'm from Gotham Solar. Mm -hmm. We are a 20-year-old solar off-grid company, DRE sector is, as we call it. Um, one of the things that I observed in this entire conversation was a bond market looking at longer terms of investment. From wind and solar, you know, where discoms are distressed, PPAs are being revoked and, you know, all kinds of things are happening. There is another opportunity which I never hear about in a discussion like this and I thought, there's so many financing people that are sitting, Gujaratis, Marwadis, <laughs> and I thought that, you know, this is the way, this is the moment I'm waiting for. So, in the DRE sector, what really, the kind of financing opportunity which is there is 35,000 crores in the next three years. 35,000 crores translates into USD $5 billion. There are two opportunities there. One, it's a short-term market. So, you have got, you have got short-term projects which range from four to six months. It might not be ideal for a bond, but let's say some guy in Indore and Trichy, he would be very happy with a six months kind of a return. That is one. Number two market, which I believe is something which is really untapped, is the bank guarantees. The number of bank guarantees that today, as a developer, that hero might be issuing, or as a DRE person that I am issuing, and we are completely dependent on our banks to issue that to us, is humongous. So for 35,000 crores, I'll have to issue 3,500 crores of bank guarantees. In the outside markets, surety bond is a very well-developed mechanism in which insurance uh, can also be given as a collateral. Yes. But in banks in India, you have to give real money, FDs, or your uh, lands as collateral. So these are the two opportunities that I see where it's completely unbanked. And whenever I've talked to any financier, they say, you know, you need to go back to your bank. There's nothing that we can do about it because bond market is supposed to be for longer term investments, 15, 25 years, whether they come or not is a different issue but it's for longer term investment. So these are the two opportunities in solar off-grid space that we look at and if there are any solutions around the same. Thank you. Do you, want to, do you want to respond to that? You should come to Irida. We have got product for both <laughs> and we've been doing it. You've got the solution right here. You should come so to we, Irida. We, we have we been give, there, ma'am, actually. <laughs> we give bid bonds as well as now we have a DRE line of credit. So please avail it. Uh, nobody's actually using it. <laughs> Sir, it cannot be used. <laughs> no, no, you can come and come and meet me. We'll see how it can be used. No issue. Uh, any other question? Yes, yes. I, I was coming back to you. Yes, but Harald, please respond to Prashant. Okay, um, so uh, just before, uh, yes, I, I would see the levels right now. I mean, the problem is we are discovering a market, right? So right now you have to market until 10 uh, years. We are trying to build it out to 20, perhaps 30 years. We, we don't know precisely where the hedge costs will fall. I mean, I can only speak for ourselves and, 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 and I will talk to our commercial bank partners where, where, the hedge, where we see the hedge costs. But uh, yeah, I, I think we are about there. Uh, the challenge will be to mobilize other people to come in. What we want to do is just to show test transactions, say, look, it can be done. And I'm, 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 I, I'm hopeful that some of the smart people here will pick it up and say, okay, we, we do this ourselves. And we find pools who want to take that type of risk. But um, allow me one distortion, which I discovered to point out, uh, to point out here. When um, the government of India provides guarantees uh, against 1.2% uh, fee again for, 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 for when, they, when an agency borrows and they guarantee this agency. And that's if they take a dollar loan, but also if they take a local currency loan. And that is unfair. I think that is a distortion. You know, the fee should be differentiated. And I would argue if the, if the hard currency guarantees 1.2% per year, if you, have a if you have a hedge in place, you will lower your credit risk dramatically and so this fee should also be lower. 
And if you have that effect, you know, then the local currency uh, interest rate will be more affordable. It, it will still be, you always have, a pro I don't want to extend this, but there are some incentives problems also with short-termism in local currency funding, which, uh, which is very important, but we will address that. Thanks, Harold. Uh, okay, Dhruba. This is the last question because I've been signaled. I don't have Rathen here, but let me just put uh, Harold Donald together along with what Rathen said. So Rathen made a point that Financial savings are low, they go into, part of it go into gold. We have gold sovereign bonds in India which are seeing good subscriptions. Kind of disagree with Ratan's view that India should not borrow externally. Probably that may trigger a good liquidity. There are two different views coming out. So, get to issuing sovereign green gold bonds. Link it to, in dollars, link it to gold prices, it will see that same mobilization. It is green, the utilization goes to green, and there is a hedging required for TCX because mm -hmm. it is a dollar denominated. So you have a sovereign, you have a gold bond. Gold bonds are working well in India. They have mobilized a lot of money because what you are doing is you are compensating it for gold prices, which Indians love and therefore the money is going into gold, great. So you get that price escalation for gold. On top of that, you get 2.5%. This is what the gold bond is working in India. Make it green, so there's a public purpose. There is a large issuance which fits well with Donald and EIB can invest <laughs> as, as much as required to a sovereign issued entity. And it could be a sovereign guarantee one, it can be a DFI two or a public financial mm -hmm. institution. And I agree with the point, Harold, but the guarantee which the sovereign charges for a public institution is not 1.2. But your point is well taken. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruba. I mean, that's a matter for another discussion um, in the room first and then in public, uh, definitely, uh, on the sovereign green bond issuance. Uh, and gold, gold. So yes, green, green gold assurance. I hadn't introduced the gold into my, uh, you know, yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. Um, we have to conclude. Uh, it has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, if any one of the panelists want to make the one last point, the, you know, we can give that. Otherwise, I'll just quickly sum up. Naveen, do you want to say something? A couple of po couple of points. Uh, so I would want to. Uh, clarify my position that when I say hedge cost is not important hmm. because our, our fundamental discussion is uh, channelizing Indian pool of capital first because that itself is totally untapped. No, I mean, we, we can't afford to say that we can uh, fund entire infrastructure from domestic savings. No way at all. We need foreign capital. We need hedging. Yes. So when we get into the specifics or micro of it, then yes, every 10 bips matters. So uh, essentially we need to do uh, uh, because the kind of funding or the scale of funding which is required uh, requires all modes to be tapped, whether it is domestic Absolutely. savings, whether it is international savings, uh, coupled with whether sovereign issuances or aggregation of demand, putting good high quality uh, intermediaries in place who pull in the demand, aggregate, issue and then supply the capital to the ultimate developer or end user kind of a thing. So I think we need some of everything because the kind of scale, I'm uh, sorry, the kind of capital which we need will not be addressed by one or two approaches, but manifold or multiple approaches. So Naveen, you have actually summed up the, uh, the session very, very well. Um, uh, what I would just need, uh, like to add is the point that uh, Donald made, that it is a certification and labeling, which is an important feature to grow in this market. Yeah. And even domestically, right now, we do not have dedicated green investors. And hence, I brought up that question that when states do that, and when they say, when they actually uh, seek out the institutional investors, the pension funds, and when they say that, okay, I have invested in green, and there is a transparency aspect attached to it related, I think that will be a big uh, mover and a big game changer in the domestic market as well. So on that note, uh, thank you so much everybody and let's give a big round of applause to the panelists as well as
to the audience. Now I see the last row filled up. So this is this was the penultimate session. Thank you so much for being with yeah, us. It's, it's amazing how many people there are yes. for, for such a technical yes, session. Absolutely. You, know? I mean, you made <laughs> our day. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.